Uh, this is Mike Skill, and you're, you're listening to Rock at Night with Vlad. Hi, this is Rock at Night. I'm Vlad. The origins of Rock at Night are deeply rooted in both the music and people of Detroit. So I'm ecstatic that tonight's guests comprise a trio of Detroit Rock's history's most illustrious sons. As a founder, founding member of Power Pop Mainstays of the Romantics, Mike Skill, has been the group's longtime guitarist and principal songwriter. He's been the architect of the, new, the band's numerous rousing hits, which are still staples on radio, TV, and film worldwide. Mike can indeed rock you up. Lately, he's also been an active solo artist, with his most recent release being the knockout track, 67 Riot, which, not coincidentally, includes the collaboration of our other guests today. The word revolutionary tends to be overused in rock, but I struggle to think of any other way to describe Brother Wayne Kramer. The co-founder of the Motor City Five, yeah, the MC5, Wayne has been a revolutionary both in sound and activism. His guitar work and stage bravado forged a strident sonic and polemic template for generations of guitarists who wanted to challenge both the musical and social status quo. Without Wayne, there is no punk rock. Now, a solo artist, uh, soundtrack composer, prisoner rehab activist, and even celebrated author, Wayne brings his identifiable guitar work and a palpable urgency to Mike's Riot single. And last but certainly not least, we're joined by a dear friend of Rock at Night, producer Chuck Alcazian. The Buddha of the Detroit music scene, Chuck has a resume sparkling with collaborations with an array of artists like Soundgarden, Pop Evil, Bob Seger, Yvonne Kral, and now Mike Skill. Chuck's approach is all about the song, and he certainly brings it with his production of Mike's single. Gentlemen, a warm welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vlad. Mike, how did 67 Riot come together? Uh, well, I lived through, uh, I think Wayne went through it too, probably. Uh, 67, 1967, uh, the riot in Detroit uh, happened. It was happening around the country. Uh, there was a lot of un unrest going on and uh, civil, uh, dis dis uh, uh, c civil uh, unrest. And um, I was about 12 years old or 13. I had discovered the the MC5 a couple of years before that mm -hmm. by the single uh, Looking at You and a, a couple other thing, other things. And uh, I had a little, a little garage band at the time. And uh, this all happened in that year. And it, it was the love and peace generation. And it was this riot. And it was just a really, uh, uh, it was a really a uh, firebrand time. I mean, anything, anything could, uh, go up at any, any minute and there was mm -hmm. so much creativity going on art wise and music wise right culturally everything was changing and uh these days happened in detroit and the national guard was down the street from my house helicopters the news was uh, over bleeding it if you want for, for mm -hmm. a bad way to put it but yeah. uh and uh instilling a lot of fear on folks on the east side and around uh around the areas outside of the center of detroit right uh, they had it like they were gonna like gangs were uh, gonna come into your neighborhood, and that's what I remember. And um, we had a curfew six o'clock or six thirty, and, uh, and I'm learning rock and roll, and I'm listening to MC5, and I'm listening to every Motown and everything that's going on in the city. And then you fast forward to the '90s, and uh, 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 I'm I moved to Portland, and I started writing a lot of songs on my own, uh, finishing just finishing complete songs. Right. Uh, for my own perspective. And um, I, I had this idea that I, I wanted to always do something with uh, 67 Riot uh, in my head. And the name came about, some lyrics came about, a groove. I had the groove down just for the first part of the verse. Mm -hmm. And um, the words started uh, really, really pulling together. And uh, we recorded it. I recorded it in my little studio uh, outside the city in a little schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where I finished it pretty much. All the other parts came together. Yeah, yeah. Recorded it. Uh, I met Chuck, came together with Chuck, and I had some other songs. And um, uh, he took those songs and, and took it to the next level. They were mixed. They were mixed at, at my studio, but yeah, they really went to the really incredible. They just sound great. And uh, uh, that's pretty much it. And then I, 
I always thought I'd, I'd get to, to my th songs. I want to have other people come in mm -hmm. and play on those songs. People I grew up with, friends, other musicians. And so Wayne was the next, uh, I mean, I was so inspired by uh, Wayne and Fred, Fred Sonic Smith. Uh, yeah, we all are. As the way they melded their guitar orchestrate like orchestrated guitars. I mean, mm -hmm. you have all my bro brothers that did that. With, the five did it in a, a really raw factory city uh, aggressive way and um, if you're a guitar player it's it's uh, the two guys you want to listen to about learning how to write and put guitars together and form songs and and then you got the attitude and the energy and the whole kind of the whole, the whole imagery around it but um, yep. they're really uh, part of my uh, growing up uh, in a big way with the drummer I was a drummer from high school I had the romantics Jimmy we mm -hmm. both were fanatics we were all fanatics for the five and yeah. all the stuff coming out of Ann Arbor and we're, we're, we're 14 years old. We couldn't get in the Grandy yet, but uh, anyway, that's how it happened. And Chuck took it to the next level and here we are. And we, I called uh, Chuck, uh, I called uh, Wayne mm -hmm. and, uh, and I asked him if he would like to check it out. And uh, I sent it over. He, he, agree, he liked it and uh, agreed to play on it. And I'm really, fortunate to have someone like that to be playing on it oh it's an incredible yeah, single and you can hear the we hear your your song craft for me is legendary but to have that that sonic icing that that wayne brought to it and chuck's ability to get the lyrics out of that mix i really it's really very endearing and uh, all three of you gentlemen i'm a kudos for that it's now the single how songs come but that's just the way it did it just kind of mm -hmm. happened. things just happen well it's interesting the timing now the single was I think initially conceived like a historical piece because obviously there's some resonance with you in terms of what happened when you were when you were when we were all younger, but now it's very urgently urgently topical for the whole world. Obviously, in light of sh all the shocking events that happened and this thing of how we've come of kind of a full 360 from that. What goes through all of your minds as you see the song and its su subject matter as it hits the streets now? Well, uh, I, I don't know. Anyone else want to take it? Like Wayne, you back in the day, well, obviously you know as well as anybody the, the dissonance that 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 was in the streets and there was socially in the society at that time. And you're seeing a, a song now conceived that kind of reprises that. Does it make you think back? Like, has have things changed? Has has the uh, has our social structure? Has our have our social dynamics really fundamentally changed at all in that period of time? Or are we just kind of have you been just treading water and we're kind of back to where we were at that point in time? We're not treading water. Um, you know, the rebellion of 67 in Detroit um, was a wake up for the nation. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're, we're in another level of that now. Um, you know, police have been murdering black people forever in America, since the beginning of America. Um, but it's really, with the coming of cell phone cameras, um, everybody knows about it now, or at least white America knows about it. Right. Um, so, you know, to, to reach into the past, to a touchstone, like the rebellion in Detroit or in Newark or in Watts, because remember the whole country uh, went up in flames. Uh, I, th I think traditionally you cannot keep your boot on people's neck uh, without them rebelling at some point, they're gonna buck. Um, it, it, in the heart of every person is the desire to be free and to be respected and to be considered. And uh, I think that's where we're at now. Um, certainly with the, the, the coming of um, um, this uh, developer in chief, uh, this buffoon that we have who's parading as president. Right. Um, people have had it. And I don't blame them. I've had it too. Indeed. Well, police brutality and incarceration are themes that have manifested very f prominently in your life and work, Wayne. Uh, the MC5's performance of the Apocalypse, that was the 68 convention in Chicago, is still very, is to spoken very reverentially. And your encounters with the law and the pen have been well chronicled, like in your autobiography and the like. 
has, from your perspective, has the order or the position of the police state in the U.S. materially changed since those heady days back in the Belle Isle and, and uh, Chicago riots? Not really, because they're still the biggest gang in town. And, you know, they have uh, legitimacy on their side. They have guns and they have badges and they're, you know, authorized to use them. Um, that dynamic hasn't changed. I, I like the idea that's emerged recently that, um, you know, a policeman with a gun is not the best idea for all of society's challenges. Right. You know, that maybe a mental health worker could go in and, and have a more successful outcome. Maybe a social worker could go in or someone that was trained in dealing with volatile situations. You know, there are um, groups of volunteers, um, what do they call them, interrupters that are going into um, um, neighborhoods where there's heavy gang activity and trying to defuse uh, volatile situations. I think these are all creative solutions to the problem of uh, an overarmed police um, quick to pull the trigger and, and not even ask any questions later. Shoot for a stack question later, yeah. Well, interesting, Mike, Mike, you're in the Portland area. I believe Portland has embraced that model to some extent, hasn't, haven't they, with regards to more uh, well, intermediate? Really, uh, uh, they've uh, got a lot of young people. It's a lot of young people, and they've got a lot of new ideas, and uh, the young kids are coming up the, uh, and not standing for it. And uh, mm -hmm. they've got the Internet, like Wayne's saying, and uh, uh, black folks are out there. And, um, and it's really actually peaceful until it gets to that point where they're uh, downtown, and then there's a few kooks that will start a little few fires, but right. it's a one block area, one or two block area. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you've got cops ramming people that, that are doing nothing. They're just ramming them on the ground and then mm -hmm. knocking them silly and, uh, yeah. and, and other things really messing them up. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, it's the city is a, uh, is a young city. It's rebellious here. People are free thinkers and, uh, uh, it's uh, a, wor a working class town in the way of uh, from the lumber times. It's still that kind of thing, uh, like Detroit. I mean, it's mm -hmm. still got that kind of vibe. Yeah. Working town. Well, interesting. Interesting. You should mention that. Let's talk a little bit about Detroit heritage and influence. That's something that's common to the four of us. Uh, uh, we all came from parts of town that perhaps didn't afford young young people the kinds of life opportunities that somebody from a Tony or place might take for granted. Uh, life, the choices in life were either to work on the line or in a shop, and there wasn't much else, and the system was kind of architected to preserve that kind of industrial Victorian order. Uh, Mike, you're from the east side. I think you went to Finney, right? Yeah, I went to school on the east side, uh, a few different schools, Jackson Junior High, Finney okay. High School. Yeah, and, Wayne, you, and Wayne, you and your brethren from the MC5 were from Lincoln Park, I think? Yeah, but I, I was all over the place. I, I grew up in, in Detroit, and then we moved down river. Then um, I moved back to Detroit for my final year of high school. I went to Cooley. Ah, okay. Yeah. Interesting that people always talk about Lincoln Park, but actually you have a stronger De Detroit resonance to that. Yeah. Uh, Lincoln Park was our uh, adventure into suburbia. Yeah, exactly. And Chuck and I are from the Don River area, but it's not to be confused with the Don Riviera, but that's another matter. <laughs> So in spite of these humble upbringings, you all exhibited a fierce ambition to transcend your surroundings. And it's not exaggeration to say that the world took notice. How did your backgrounds shape your vision and maybe your concept or your ideas as young artists? Uh, Mike. Uh, well, a working class family. Uh, I, uh, geez, uh, my dad would uh, move into a house, fix it up, and we'd move to the next house up a little bit level higher. And we did mm -hmm. that for four or five houses and uh, right. get us into a good, in a good a place to live and all that. And uh, uh, my brother worked at uh, Chrysler. Uh, my mom worked in the auto industry in a, a shop. 
I worked in the auto industry at uh, uh, shops to buy a guitar, buy amps. <laughs> yep. I uh, worked either from, uh, from midnight, midnight to six or 11 o'clock to six in the morning, seven in the morning. Yep. And, uh, go to sleep and go, uh, go rehearse for uh, a few hours. And then, you know, do the, that's what it was after school, yep. after high school. And uh, yeah, well, um, you know, uh, Wayne knows uh, Motown, Motown and black music was a big deal in uh, Detroit. There was a lot of, uh, uh, early, do, uh, early, uh, not I don't want to call it doo but uh, pro- vocal groups uh, mm-hmm. were, were the big thing, and uh, and uh, and uh, then then you had the Motown stuff happening, and uh, that kicked it in. And it's always been a pretty down on the street type of sound. I mean, uh, I remember I was pretty young. Well, I remember when uh, Smokey Robinson's first song sing came out. Uh, my, uh, what was it? Uh, I can't think of the single right now, but uh, it's early, really street music. You felt like these guys were, uh, you were, they were part of the community. Uh, Motown was part of the community at, t- at that time. Right, in touch. And, uh, yeah, and uh, that moved right up into uh, the rock era when the rock era happened. The Five reminded me like a combination of the Who, Yardbirds, and then you could throw a little bit of James Brown showmanship in there. Mm-hmm. Show bit almost, but in a new era. Right. And uh, I mean, Wayne was doing James Brown steps on the guitar. He was dancing I, I, like James Brown on guitar, you know, and it was like, it was such stole a, it all from James Brown. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't tell you, I don't give away your secret, but <laughs> it's what it, no secret. Yeah. And then uh, <laughs> there, was, there was a lot, a lot of bands in, uh, I think, uh, were, were uh, soul bands in Detroit from the 50, or late 50s and 60s, soul bands doing Ray Charles and, and James Brown, and, mm-hmm. and they do standards. They do standards. Right. And all the bars were m- mostly older folks going to the bars, hearing uh, a piano bar and, mm-hmm. you know, the, uh, lounge singers and all that. It wasn't until later when the British invasion that all the bars became rock clubs. Right. So, but uh, in, in, in Ann Arbor was cool. Being Ann Arbor is a lot like Portland. That's my comparison. Portland mm-hmm. and Ann Arbor are kind of the, it's like Ann Arbor was, but, uh, yeah, that was the new rock thing, the new uh, culture area, Wayne State and uh, Wayne State downtown Detroit. Yeah, I got to give props to my pro- alma mater, but uh, uh, you mentioned uh, cool Ann Arbor, Wayne, Wayne State. But yeah, awesome. And brother Wayne, how about yourself? I mean, your background—it's been docu- you've documented in your biography and like. Uh, how has that shaped? How did that shape your? identity earlier on musically and maybe even to this day because obviously people change over time but is that still a part of your identity in terms of how you look at the world and your music of course um well you know in the 60s there was a great focus put on being original having your own sound and your own look and um the MC5 worked pretty hard on that, and I always felt like I always had a kind of resentment uh, with the the international music scene because they kind of looked down their nose at us being from Detroit. Sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, as if we couldn't have good ideas or, or uh, you know, breakthrough ideas or the original thought uh, that you had to be from London or you had to be from New York or you had to be from San Francisco. And it kind of um, motivated us to, to dig in even harder, you know, to, to kick out the jams, <laughs> to kind of show the, the world that you know, we had good ideas, we were about something. And in fact, our ideas were a little more stretched out than the stuff I was hearing from London or San Francisco. Amen, brother. So, you know, it was just really taking pride in a place that, um, you know, I always, I, I adored living in Detroit. I was proud that we made American cars in Detroit and and that we honored uh, and found nobility in hard work and hard labor. And uh, that stayed with me all my life. I mean, years and years later, when I made the mistake of 
trying to form a band with Johnny Thunders, mm -hmm. it would, we would, it'd be like, come on, man, it's six o'clock, let's, let's go to work. And he'd say, man, I don't go to work, I go to play. And <laughs> my perspective was always, I'm going to work. I took pride in working and, uh, you know, my, it might just be a semantic thing, but I don't think it is. I think it, it has to do with your, your general, um, you know, perspective on how you fit in the world. That's a very shrewd observation. And I think as I talk to many Detroiters that, who have been diaspora into the world, they all share that kind of identity where work has shaped you, even though you don't realize it at the time when you're younger, it becomes part of your grain, your, your DNA, and you never, you never lose that, no matter whether you go into creative work or otherwise. And, and you know, I never realized until I started touring in the MC5 that in other cities, all the white people lived over there and all yep. the people of color lived over here. Because in yep. Detroit, you know, I, my earliest memories are, are other kids of color and, and um, that other cities didn't share our knowledge and experience with organized labor with mm -hmm. the union movement. Yes. We all knew what union meant in Detroit. You know, the United Auto Workers affected everybody and showed right. us that, that collective bargaining was the only way we could um, compete with big corporations, yeah. um, the, the auto uh, companies. So, you know, I didn't really snap to that until I was touring in the band and started realizing, shit, these people don't know anything about the union. They don't know anything about uh, about uh, people of color, of different cultures, of different music. Yeah, and it seems to drive a lot of disdain. I think people aren't familiar with that, and they, at least stateside, of what I'm seeing is that people view it very hostily. But you take the re the message to Europe, and they readily identify with that. Maybe it's because there's an established industrial culture there. But as you've seen, the MC5 is especially iconic in Western Europe. I went to a, a meeting. We tried to organize the film and TV composers out here in LA. Mm -hmm. And the National Labor Relations Board has always kind of kept us out. Mm -hmm. We had this meeting and the Teamsters came and they were going to take us under their wing like they had done with the casting directors. Mm -hmm. And the Teamster chief came up and he started talking and he, and he said, listen, uh, if you guys are with us and those film producers and those TV big shots start to abuse you, we will visit them with misery and <laughs> agony. <laughs> and uh. all, these, all these fucking effete film composers are all at Twitter. Oh my goodness, oh gosh, did you hear what he said? Oh no. And I'm like, what are you guys surprised that's the Teamsters, you know. Yeah, brass knuckles and they the... roll. <laughs> yep. Detroit had its uh, what in the thirties uh, was uh, the union riots, right? In the thirties, uh, mm -hmm. that was a big riot at the time. Indeed, oh, yeah. lots yeah, of them. Had a few of them. Yeah. 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 The story, the stories are legendary of Harry Bennett being the the hired yeah. thug for Henry Ford and how he marshaled all these people from the military to be pretty much headcrackers yeah. and. And, you know, it, we, unfortunately, they pay, a lot of people played for with their blood on the sidewalk, but you would think that to this day, people should be appreciative of what it does give us. 40-hour weeks and, you know, benefits like that. But Sure. Well, yeah, so. no, it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing, and it's still an issue today. I mean, granted, there, you know, there, the unions have an element of corruption in them themselves. Right. But still, in principle, union is, is where we want to be. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, I, you mentioned Hollywood, Wayne. Really enjoyed your soundtrack to the Cream documentary. How did that come about? How did your involvement with that come about? Um, they asked me to sit for an interview. And in the process of the interview, I said, who's scoring this? And they said, well, we don't know. We haven't thought. And I said, I am. <laughs> 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 yeah. Who else should do this? I mean, yeah. Very apropos. I'm not only a client. Well, I want to ask, I want to ask Wayne, you had, there were so many bands coming into Grandy. I mean, 
you were, I mean, you were, had to be meeting Janis Joplin and, and the, the whole band and you, and Cream Yardbirds, Jimmy Page, everybody was coming through. How was that? That was pretty, pretty, I oh, think. Oh, it was terrific. I, Very I exciting. Thought, and I think in some ways Led Zeppelin, the first album, it had that Detroit thing because of you guys and because of Detroit. We affected a lot of groups, I think, Detroit and their, their energy. And, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and still do, you know, mm. D Detroit, you know, it's a tough city and it's a tough city to do something in the arts. Mm. And if you can find a way, a path to, to uh, recognition out of Detroit, um, that will sustain you well. I mean, look at um, Eminem and, and you guys in particular. When I, when I, I have to tell you, when I got back from the penitentiary, I, I started going around to clubs to see what was happening. Because when I left, there was no punk rock. No. And, and, uh, and when I came back, someone said, you need to go see the Romantics. And I went to the Silverbird Lounge. Yeah. And I was knocked out with you guys. You killed me. I mean, you looked great. You wore band uniforms. You had all, all red leather outfits on. And you sang good. And you played good. And I thought, all right, everything's going to be fine, man. These guys are carrying on. They're rocking it. They're holding up the tradition. Yeah, and you, they still you are. are. You guys That's are a great you, band. You guys were the, yeah. And you guys and a few other bands were the, the influence, you know, that attitude, the way you hit, we hit our instruments different in Detroit, I think. We play them different, we hit them in different. We hear it, it's gotta be, it's gotta hit you. I mean, it's gotta come, the bass in the water, it. something in the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you hear that in some of your work, Mike. I remember like, um, what I like about you, there was an interesting chiming effect to your guitar. And you were, was it a Rickenbacker you played on that track, or? Yeah, it was, and and I got to say, the songs that I listen, like looking at you and uh, 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 Shaken Street. I mean, that's yeah. my influences and three three chord songs uh, from uh, oh god, from sixties, early sixties, the three chord Buddy Holly songs and fifties. Right. Those are the things that did it. That's I always wanted to be simple, straight ahead. Everyone was getting way off track with these. 20 minute guitar, guitar solos and drum solos and keyboard solos, Rick Wakeman, you go to a show and it's like this big, and that's what punk rock did, came back. It was all kind of new wave of punk was just to get back to basics. Like the five, like the five, doing rock and roll with Chuck Berry licks and all that. And Yeah, very elemental. That's uh, essential for honesty in music. Yeah. Well, 67 Riot has been a clarion call for these fucked up times and the reception for both the message and the sound of the song has been very strong. We loved it at Rocket Night. Are there any plans for a follow-up? Uh, of, of, of more music? More, mu mu more music, maybe a collaboration further with you gentlemen, oh, I think. Um, well, 2020, I 2020, 20 Riot. Yeah. 2020 uh, Riot. Pandemic Blues, I don't know, but. Uh, the, uh, the Pandemic Blues? No, I'm just throwing that out there, but. Um, Wayne, uh, so I'm gonna just keep sending a few songs to Wayne. Uh, and if he likes something, he, you know, maybe that'll happen, you know, or if it works out the way it works out, you know. Happy to do it. Send yeah, me I mean, everything. Yeah, I mean, Mike just I think kind of like this whole thing is making a lot of musicians work in different ways now. Calling other people, we're sit, we're at home. We can catch them. We can catch them at home now. They're not on the road or in right. Europe or something. And uh, and I could call up uh, someone and say, are you free to check out, check this out, check that out? So I think it's going to happen more and more. Has it changed for, for all of you on the call? Has it changed how you're approaching and thinking about music? Because the whole process of the protocol of getting a studio, no offense, Chuck, but finding a studio and getting somewhere, is it more intimate now where you can perhaps create something more intimately and then share it with a collaborator and have it be a kind of a tighter uh, feedback loop? Or have you seen any kind of difference when it comes to that? that process about when you want to... I, Chuck has I I see amazing humans right now um, collaborating and just sending it off to guys like me to finish up and yep. it, it's it, I, I, I've seen I've seen people talk that I would never have thought in a million years would have worked together in the last six months and it's it's really it's exciting um, and I think, I think having be, you know, being from Detroit, I think a lot of people uh, um, are looking 
to the musical cities to kind of guide some of these musicians right now who right. are they're they're lost they're i mean they're not lost musically but they're lost humanitarian wise not in their belief system but in just they're confused as to how they're to go forward with their careers you know so i'm sure you guys could add to that yeah well there's there's no money <laughs> you hit it wayne you hit it right there the hedge fund guys no took all the money and the, the isps um yep. make all the money off of our work and they don't pay us Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't make a living as a session player or you can barely make a living touring. Streaming is a downfall, I'm afraid. Yeah, until there's a new paradigm that figures out how to pay the creators, we're in a tough spot. That's correct. That is very correct. You, you've become you've become a merchandising machine. You know, you, you basically have turned into the rock and roll gap, you know, the store, the gap. It's right. like, you pray to God that you can sell t-shirts and merch just to cover your bus money, you know, or like, I think Vlad, we talked about this mm -hmm. before. It's like, yep. it, it, unfortunately, the art is, is, has been so watered down. Um, and that's why I work with guys like Mike and Wayne and, and, the veterans because i mean the the thought processes behind everything is is about work and a lot of these younger artists they're starving because they've relied on just touring and and they haven't monetized all of their talents as as well as they should you know and right it, you know people don't have any money to spend you know it's it's really sad right now so you, so you give them the music and sell them a shirt. Yeah, that's exactly right. Exactly, Wayne. That's exactly what I was saying. You see the other wrong? way. Is that wrong? Is that right? Who knows? You know, it used to be the other way. Exactly, Vlad. It was the other way. You'd buy a single or an album. Right. They'd throw in a like a promotional tchotchke, and now uh, I don't. Know. It's, well, and I, I don't I, see it debating. I think if you work in the digital culture, you see that the. The, the desire to, to further commoditize any experiences or interactions, as they call it, makes uh, it just cheapens even more so. And they view artists and content creators as merely being data dumping points. They're not looked at as, uh, as artists. And until that changes and the system changes, we're kind of being this quagmire. Well, it's, it's up to us to, it's up to us to, as I mean, I can't speak for Wayne and Mike, but as far as you know, I'm a little younger, but I have nothing but respect for for those those moments that that they have created, and um, I try to instill that in the younger artists that I produce. Um, and it's really, it, I think kids are scared to take it to another level, where you know, getting in a van and just playing your ass off and, and, and playing songs. Now these kids are, they're, they're getting Apple music streamed for nine ninety nine a month. Are you right. kidding me? You can listen yeah. to like a hundred million songs. It's like, we, it, it, I always, I always refer to the, when you go to see a movie and you always see the stunt man do the, do the shindig and at the beginning of the movie and, and then the message comes up, don't steal movies. Cause I'm risking my life making this movie so you can eat your popcorn and, and your right. and your frothy drink and and you know it's the same thing with music you know we we bust our ass we bust our ass all, all my friends are losing trillions of dollars right now like touring and all the techs all the i mean it's just quagmire that is that is the best word i i think it's 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 just such monumental shit times as far as see when there were riots were going on, when, when Michael and Wayne were talking about, people could still work. You, you could still have some sort of sensibility of, of work. People can't even go outside right now, you know, let alone make any money. And, and I think that's what Wayne was attesting to. And Michael, they were just saying, you know, it was just, um, it was just very stressful times, you know, right uh, at the t back then. But now it's like, it's, it, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. Thing, you know yeah well, there's I saw no your post sorry go ahead 
there's no films and TV in production uh, or as much as there was, you know, a smaller, on a smaller scale. So no songs are getting, uh, no new songs are getting taken from bands or, or writers like Wayne's saying, and less work for Wayne for, for doing movies, yeah. movies that are coming out. Uh, they're just getting back into it, I guess, slowly. But, um, you know, just that whole uh, uh, money stream. Yeah, and the pipeline. Is, I read that uh, uh, the music industry, and, and it's not unbelievable that it's larger, it's larger than agriculture. Just the agriculture in America is, what we do is like so huge. Uh, Money-wise. Well, the, you know, the, the hip hop guys um, <clears throat> and women seem to, you know, if, if they control the means of production, um, they are realize some of, you know, at the very top of the pyramid, they're realizing uh, profits and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, getting paid. Uh, but, you know, even that, you know, these are Faustian deals that you, that they make the, these 360 deals yeah. um, and they look good and, you know, they can make an expensive video, but they have to pay for all that. <laughs> Absolutely. And, right. They're making the a deal with the, the devil. Day, at the end of the day, you know, there's, there's generally, there's usually no money left. I mean, the caterer gets paid before the artist. Yeah. Yeah. That's a truth. I mean, this it's is some... not this is not a good time for a life in the arts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tough. I would tough. discourage young people from from uh, attempting it, but they don't listen to me anyway. So, <laughs> I think our I parents may have said me. the same thing once upon a time, and uh, well, I think it's always been bleak, but especially now the economics are bleak, and uh, well, we'll see how it transforms. You have to do this. Because you love doing it, you love the process of of creating music, of uh, bringing your friends in and and talking about what you're doing and going out and trying to win people over. Yeah, if you don't love all of that, then you can't do this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. This, you know, because there, there there's virtually no money in it. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a, it's a tough game right now. Yeah. Interestingly, hearing all of your stories here, it takes, takes us back to how you all started from a point of love in your career. Yeah. You're, you yeah. had a love for justice. You had a love for, for rhythm and music and the like, and that, that compelled you. And, well, there are periods of time in which obviously it was more lucrative, or at least it was able to sustain you better. Now you're deal, you have that, that, that one tangible thing, that, that, no, well, actually intangible thing from when you started, that love that's carrying you forward. That's, uh, that's sustaining you. And it's not yeah, ironic. It's not coincidental. Yeah. Yes, Mike. The past, past, passion is, is passed on generation, generationally. Mm -hmm. I, I'm willing to be me to people, you know, it just goes on and on. And, uh, I was going to say, uh, Chuck just did, uh, you did a record with Ivan Kral. He had to go. I mean, he, it was huge in, in Czechoslovakia, but here, you don't even know it's around. Right. So he probably made a few dollars on that, but that's a good example of you got to go up, do what you can do. I, I guess he went know. to where the people supported yeah. him. You know, it's really interesting. And, and as everyone knows, I mean, and Vlad, we've talked about this before. The stories I've heard from Ivan, you know, just from working with Jim and, and Iggy and, um, and, Blondie and all these amazing humans and, 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 the, and, and, and the passion that was behind it and the scene, it, like, again, like what Wayne and Michael said, it was street music with support groups. It was hardworking people who, who, you know, wanted to just catch a break, man, and just spread that love. And, and we always talked about, Ivan always called me Bubba. He'd always say, Bubba, you don't, you don't, you don't love what you do. You, you, you are what you do. And basically he was saying in his thought process was it's just, it's just me. And it's not a, it's, it's, it's not a labor of love. It's a love of labor, you know, and it's, and that's what I think went into 67 riot was Michael had a story to tell and we brought it out. And, and, and Wayne was, Wayne was our, Wayne was our champion who, who, put the cherry on top, you know, and, and what an honor for me to work with both of these gentlemen. And, 
you know, <laughs> Mike and I were just like little kids talking about Wayne while we're working on this song. <laughs> and, you know, we just, we just, and Wayne's an extreme gentleman and, and cares about his, his love and his passion for what he's done. I mean, I mean, we can't even name, I mean, we could sit here for five weeks and we still wouldn't even talk about all the accomplishments of Wayne and Michael, let alone myself, not even close to these two, but you know, right. it's an honor just to even just sit on this zoom, you know, so. it's an honor for me, certainly. So Michael, what's, uh, what's next up with you? What projects or what uh, endeavors are you uh, looking at next? I, you can't force, uh, in my opinion, you can't force songs like 67 Riot. So you can't really like, it's got to come together uh, organically. And uh, I, um, I recorded a, a bunch of those tunes and uh, I gave them to Chuck. Chuck uh, mixed them. So I've got a few more left to release this year. So I think I'll get one more single out maybe and uh, hopefully an EP and then a long player, uh, an album. Wonderful. Well, that's in the next, you know, within the next six months or so, something like that. Wonderful. Looking we'll forward to kind that. Of state how we, uh, however we can with this whole thing. I don't exactly. know, you know, playing live. There's not much playing live right now, so. Exactly. Keep Make singing, it. Mike. What's Mike, up? keep singing, man. You're a good singer. Keep singing. Thanks, man. I love your, your, the sound of your voice. You're a good Thank singer. You. Yes, Thank indeed. You. Uh, all we could do is, uh, just keep going forward, and uh, um, I don't know what to say. Much more than that. Mike has so many songs; it's funny. It's uh, Mike's got hard drives and hard drives. I'm sure I'm sure Wayne does too, as, as I do as well. And um, I think um, the difficulty is going. We can take any song and make it fun and awesome. It's just like we we try to look for the meaningful things, the things that the, the legacy, the leave the legacy, you know, I mean, that's kind of where I think all bands should be right now, you know, something tangible, right? You hope. We, we came from this really big thing out of like from Detroit. I mean, it's really a, it was a really a passionate thing and it's, it's something that it just won't go away. It's something in us. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's on us. It's in, I can't stop doing what I do. And Wayne can't, you know, it's just, it's can't kind stop. Of a, won't uh, stop. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say before in Detroit, there was a huge jazz scene at the time. I mean, the fifties and you still have Baker's keyboard lounge and the five used to go off into these jazz, uh, 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 flourishes and, uh, and, and avant-garde and uh, kind of like, uh, just, uh, really uh I, I don't know how to describe it but it's just a, like a really free for, free form it's really a free form mm -hmm. thing they put with this it was really good and, like bebop uh, okay well, well the next form. the next it, stage after post bebop yeah, with yeah. the coming of uh in the in the uh mid 60s you know uh archie shep and yeah. john coltrane and sun ron albert eiler and cecil taylor mm -hmm. there was a whole movement in jazz that broke away from bebop and and improvising melodies over standards and to a newer uh and i'd like to think more pure sonic dimension it was a huge influence on uh, me and the mc5 because i you know i had to answer the question if i'm playing my best chuck berry solo what where's the next step how do i go one step beyond and I got the answer in the free jazz movement. So we embrace that completely. And I think Mike mentioned um, an important uh, consideration in that Detroit has always been the home of great musicians. Uh, going back to the 20s and 30s, uh, if the big band leaders needed new musicians, they would go to Detroit to find them because of the great music programs at Northwestern yep. and at Cass Tech. They would produce the highest caliber players that all the band leaders wanted and, and that continued uh, through the, the bebop era and the small groups. And then with the coming of rhythm and blues, I mean that Motown recording band, the Funk Brothers, those were all bebop 
players. They were jazz musicians, yes. but they didn't play down to pop music. They applied everything they knew about harmony and syncopation and rhythm to popular music, which is, you know, it's still some of the most sophisticated songwriting um, in the world. Yeah, very transcendent. Well, yeah. finally, from one expat Detroit to another, I got to ask you before we drop off the call, when you get back into town in Detroit, what's the food or dining establishment that you always have a hankering for the most? No. Um... <laughs> Italian. <laughs> yeah, it used to be, yeah, used to be uh, Coney Islands and stuff like that, but then you had uh, Greek food and now you've got Arabic and Lebanese food has been huge in Detroit for years right. before it's gotten out to the, the world and in, to America. I went, I grew up uh, next door to uh, Lebanese kids I played with and I learned and they had this kibbe, whatever that was when I was, you know, in sixties, no one else knew that. I mean, that's just getting around now out, out, out here and uh, whatever. There's just a big, just like music, there's a ton of great food and, yeah, there's great food in Detroit. Yeah. My wife is Lebanese, so I know all about kibbe and, yeah. and fatouche and, and tabbouleh. Yeah. We have it all the time. Yeah, there you um, go. I, you know, Checker Barbecue is always one of my favorites in Detroit. Um, the soul food is, is world class. So, but, you know, you're right. I mean, I agree with you anyway that, that uh, Detroit has good eating. There's a lot of good restaurants in Detroit, good food. I mean, these are people that work hard and, you know, you, you work hard, you play hard and you want to have, uh, you know, put something in your cake hole that matters. <laughs> you got to remember, Detroit was a smoky, dirty factory town in the, in the 50s and 60s. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it, it, 24 hours a day they were making cars. It, went, it wouldn't stop at nine to five. It was 24 right. hours a day. Right. Yeah. And I think there was a lot of uh, tension because uh, I don't, uh, black folks were getting the jobs and the pay with the car companies. I don't even, they may, may have been floor sweepers or I'm not even sure if they were on the line at the time back then. Mm -hmm. uh, well, so they, were, they, they, got, were, they got, they were last hired, first fired, yeah, and yeah. they got the worst jobs on yeah. the shop floor, the most and dangerous they, jobs, yeah. the most toxic jobs. And, and, you know, I mean, the reasons behind the rebellion of 1967 uh, were that people of color, black people in particular, did not share in the prosperity that white Detroiters um, experienced. Um, they didn't share in it economically, they didn't share in it culturally, and they didn't share in it politically. They were, they were, they were elbowed outside of the of the of of life to the margins detroit. and and then you add the detroit police department um coming down on them um just like they've always done um it's, it's no surprise that the that the place didn't burn down sooner <laughs> the white white and white all white police department yeah all, all white white all white shop foreman yeah yeah, you're, you're asking for it. <laughs> no, I always thought that the the, six, six, the the white flight from Detroit was had a um, reason because when Malcolm X and um, uh, Martin Luther King came to town in '62, I think it was, or three, it freaked everybody out on the east side of Detroit. The the long parade, there was like a hundred thousand people down there. Yeah. Most black people, black folks, the east side people started moving out to the suburbs right away after that. They were flipping out, really. Well, they, re they really moved after the rebellion. And, you know, that's when everybody in Detroit started buying guns. Yeah. And then, you know, where before, the, the, before then, if two neighbors had an argument, they might have a fist fight and someone gets a bloody nose. And afterwards, they, they're all strapped and they, you know, they break out their shit and they start shooting. I mean, you know, a city of uh, just over a million people with 900 homicides a year, you know, that's, whew. but they, you know, that, that has to do with larger uh, economic forces, you know, the, that the, the big three came in and, and uh, raked all the money off 
And, and then when uh, uh, the Japanese and the Koreans came up with better ideas for cars, they took their money and went home. They moved their plants to Kentucky where there was no unions. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and, and you end up with a city full of workers and no work. And uh, of course, you know, uh, desperate times uh, make people desperate and they start doing desperate things. And, uh, you know, heroin flooded the city and the result was, uh, you know, chaos. Yes. And, the, and the, really the destruction of what was once a great American city. Yeah. I mean, less, great. Than, less than 700,000 people in the city of Detroit today. There are still veins of greatness there, but you're seeing a lot of the social vestiges of better times and better, uh, or at least grander times and yeah. try to revitalize. I mean, they're trying. And, you know, I support them 100%. Uh, I do what I can to help, but it's tough there. Without, without a, an industry or a, a manufacturing uh, base, you know, I think Detroit probably one day could be Portland, you know, a nice, small American city, but it'll never be what it was in the 60s and, and in the 70s. Yeah, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yeah, exactly. Well, gentlemen, it's poetically appropriate you've regaled us tonight with entertaining tales and provoking thoughts as you've always done with your art. As Detroiters, past and present, we're deeply proud of who you and how you represent us with energetic eloquence and conscience, and I really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you, Vlad. So, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, Vlad. Yeah. Very hallucinating. Thanks for having us. So, that wraps, so that wraps up our conversation for tonight. Look for Mike Steele's 67 Riot single on all streaming platforms and at MikeSteele.com. And look for his amazing vinyl pressing that just came out from Third Man Records. That's a nice way to keep it in the Detroit family, man. So kudos to that. I, I just got mine, Mike. Oh, good. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Looks good. Yeah. There it is. I love it. And I got this. Test, I got this test today. pressing. I got, just got this today. Uh -huh. I'm, re I'm reading it. I've been reading it. This won't fit in my computer. I'm trying stuff. to figure out how to get no it in No floppy there. disk. Yeah, how's that work? How do you bootleg that thing? <laughs> <laughs> Can I rip that? <laughs> there are ways. Sir Chuck Wayne has ways. Kramer. <laughs> yeah. And catch Wayne Kramer's soundtrack to the Cream documentary, now available for on demand at all streaming platforms. And pay attention to the Guitar Jails Foundation yeah. at, uh, that you operate for um, sonic rehabilitation of people in the incarcerated, you know, in the, in the penal system. That's a very admirable yeah. effort you're doing, Wayne. Thank you. It's the jailguitardoors.org if anyone wants to learn what we do and how we do it and they want to help. We have uh, 2.3 million of our fellows behind lock and key today. And if, if we don't do something to help them change for the better while they're in custody, they will most certainly change for the worse. And 95% of them are coming home someday and they're gonna sit next to you at the movies if we ever get to go back to the movies. And they'll right. stand next to you in line six feet apart at the supermarket. So we can do something now to mitigate the damage. Go to jailguitardoors.org and help us out. Well put. And Chuck Alcazian has a never-ending stream of productions on his plate. I especially fancy his recent uh, run of 80s covers, and you can find them on all major streaming platforms. So shout out to you, Chuck, as well. Thanks, Vlad. I appreciate it. It's just a fun little project I'm doing just to, uh, just to bring some happiness to some people. So. Yes, indeed. And I'd be most remiss if I didn't acknowledge the immense help we got from Gina Giuliano and Unleashed Music in making this conversation happen. Gina, you're the best, and thank you again. Gina, thank you. Peace and health, and I wish you all the best, and maybe uh, talk again uh, in the future. Thank Appreciate you. it. Yep. Good luck, Thanks Mike. You guys. Thanks, guys. See ya. Thanks, guys. Nice work, Vlad. Thank you.